Tom has spent much of yesterday trying to figure out how to put a fishing rod together. He hadn't wanted to spend too long on it. It had been complicated a little by the fact that Whipperna had really wanted him out of the workshop and had been doing a poor job of hiding it. When Essie had swung by a touch later, she had been somewhat surprised to see him and seemingly completely forgot what it was she wanted to say. So, all in all, it wasn't hard to work out that they were definitely up to something, but he didn't know what. Nor did he think he wanted to know, since it seemed likely to be some sort of surprise, though what they had in mind, he had no idea. So with him gently evicted from the workshop, he had two choices. Go back to the smithy and risk his sanity, or go looking for somewhere else where he could get away with trying to put a fishing pole together. When he had remembered that nearly every tool in the keep was in one of those two rooms, he had swallowed his concerns and gone to the smithy. Perhaps he could get some guide rings made, or mayhaps a hook or two. If worse came to worst, he could always just have a go with just a line and hook after all. It sounded easy enough, so he figured he would have a crack at that forging thing. He knew everyone had always told him it was damn hard, but a simple hook? How hard could it be? He had watched Shiva work iron or steel a thousand times by now, so he ought to have picked up something by now. And she made it look so incredibly easy. Roughly three hours later, he was sitting in Shiva's rocking chair, pouring sweat and watching Jackie make the simple little hook for him, with Tink and Twitch waiting their turn rather impatiently. Twitch was holding a by now truly mangled looking piece of iron, Tink having had his hammer taken away by Jackie as she worked. To Tom, they looked like a pair of children waiting for their turn on the swing set, which he would have been laughing at if he wasn't so damn tired after fucking it up for what felt like the quadrillionth time. His mood was only worsened when Jackie triumphantly put down the hammer after little more than ten minutes of work and let the two eager men have another go at their project. She came walking back over to Tom, holding up the very crude and certainly too large hook she had fashioned. It was so much better than anything he could have ever forged, though. That was for certain. Ta-da! That's just not fair, Tom let out, as the hook was deposited in his outstretched hand. He rocked back in the chair while inspecting it closely. It would probably do the trick. No, you just suck at forging. Kinda thought you would learn quicker if I'm honest, Jackie grinned, grabbing the cloth to wipe away at least some of the soot given off by the forge. But it just wasn't working. It was snap, not turn out straight. Melt in the fire, Jackie added. Referencing the few accidents he had suffered, or trying to heat the delicate piece back up again. That wasn't my fault. You got the forge too hot, Tom protested. He was certain that at least one of the times she had put on a big blow with the bellows, which was not needed, leading to him just getting the end of his hook back out of the coals. No, I didn't, Jackie protested, crossing her arms and snatching back the hook. I kept it perfectly steady at all times. Tom grumbled a little. He really wanted that hook. If it came to it, he guessed he could make do without the rod, but he needed that hook no matter what. Could you maybe harden and temper it? You know, in case you people are actually right about what's down there. Um, sure I guess, Jackie replied, looking at the small metal item. Pretty sure you'll break the line first though. That is true. We also need bait and a pole for it. You know those little rings I talked about? I ain't making those for you. Get mum to do it, or use the lathe thingy. I'm sure we can work out bait though. What a fish like? Hopes and dreams? Maybe children? Twitch merrily suggested, as the two started hammering away once more, with no sign of a change in tactics. No, no. Some kind of smelly meat should do well. Normally you would use some smelly fish, but, well, we're kind of short on that, Tom clarified, shaking his head. Maybe some old potted venison that's gone off? Jackie asked curiously. That's the stuff where it's just in a clay pot with something in the bottom and butter to seal it tight, right? Tom questioned, 
trying to think back to some of the odder ingredients he had encountered at the keep thus far. Well, you cook it first, but yeah, pretty much. Smells like a rotten carcass when it goes off. That should do it, I guess. So, rings and a rod to go then? As I said, I am not making those rings for you, Jackie reiterated, crossing her arms in defiance while still hanging on to his hook. Fine, fine. I'll probably just ask Shiva. Might be a good idea to burn them onto the rod or something. Don't think we have any decent glue. Would hoof glue work? Tink questioned, as the now cold plate was stuck back in the fire. With a big yank, Twitch pulled on the bellows with reckless abandon, the coal spewing sparks and embers as they glowed nearly white at the centre. What is hoof glue? Tom found himself asking, having no idea at all, really. The only natural glues he knew of were tree sap and that joke about boiling a horse down for glue, so maybe it was like that. It's made from hoofs, connective tissue, skin, I think. All sort of connecty bits. We must have some, right? The inventor questioned, looking to Jackie of all people. I think so, yeah. Kind of hard to make bows without it. Oh, right. Composite bows. Forgot about that. Tom let out as it clicked. He had no idea if that would work, but he supposed it was worth a try at least. That still leaves the rod, though. You should ask Kullinger about that, even if you don't like him that much. Not that I blame you, by the way. He would also know where the glue is. What about using an old bow for the rod? Surely you would have a broken one somewhere, Tink suggested, as he stuck the metal plate back in the fire, after checking how red it had gotten. Twitch continuing to pump away. Actually, that's not a bad idea, Tom agreed. At least on paper. Well-seasoned wood, nice and springy, tough but light. Yeah, that should be perfect. You wouldn't happen to have a longbow, would you? Like, a bigger one? Jackie questioned, tilting her head. Yeah, but it's just wood. It would be taller than me, Tom went. Holding up his hand to as high as he could, without getting up from the really rather comfy chair. No, she answered, a little unsurely. Why would you want a bigger one? I mean, I guess it could look cool. Long story, I guess. But a regular one will do, I think. Unstrung, it's sort of straight, I guess. I mean, not really, but I hate to break it to you. That's also cooling it you want for that. Fine, fine. Do you know where he is? What would he even spend his day off on if he's not down here? Probably in his room praying or whittling away on something. Come on. Let's check before those two cause a fire and it's our fault. Hey! I have worked here for months! Tink objected, looking up from his work. Not once have I caused a fire. Only minor explosions! Yeah, yeah, and that plate is going to melt soon. Even if it's just hot in the middle, Jackie retorted, as Tom got to his feet, finding himself pushed towards the door with a slap on the bum, a snickering Jackie following him. Saf had gone to have a nap once they had finished in the library. She had just been so damn tired. Saf? You up still? Saf? Came a tired sounding call from outside her door. Who is it? Saf replied groggily, not actually wanting to wake up yet. Nor did she care if anyone could hear that fact. She didn't even know what time it was, but there wasn't any light peeking in anymore through the narrow windows. Fengi, can I come in? Sure. Didn't lock the door, I don't think. Sure enough, the sound of the latch sliding up was soon heard, followed by the door slowly creeping open. Sav turned around in bed to watch Fengi step inside, carrying a small oil wick lamp, closing the door behind her. Shouldn't you be sleeping? Sav questioned, peeking down the dark unlit hallway the torches and lamps long since extinguished. Yeah, I should, Fengi replied, slack-eared in the dim light of the lamp. Her face was hard to make out, but she sounded ready to drop where she stood. That much was clear to Saf. I just... I was thinking. The young huntress didn't make it much further, 
seeming lost in thought or perhaps on the verge of falling asleep while standing. It was warm enough inside, so it at least shouldn't be the cold. Sit down, Fengi, please. There's a chair over there, Sav tried, pointing into the darkness. Thanks, was all the reply she got, as Fengi went to fetch the chair, scooting it across the floor to sit down next to Sass' bed with a long sigh. So, what is it? Saf, do you think your drill tried to kill us today? Uh, no? Was the best Saf could come up with. She wasn't even sure the dragon could. She's under orders not to. She can't break that. I don't know. Do you really think it was just a mistake? Seems a little far-fetched. Even if she did try, she then saved us afterward. You weren't shouting any coherent orders as we slid, right? Probably not, no. So she could just let us die then, right? If she meant to kill us to start with. I suppose it just felt off. How could she not know that would happen? She's an arrogant bastard who thinks she's invincible, and probably hasn't done honest work in decades, if not a century. Fair point, I suppose. What's got you thinking all this? Just some things she said. Mind you, she had a really shit day today. She managed to get under your skin with something she said? Saf countered, trying to sound disapproving. I suppose, Fengi admitted, ducking her head in shame. Oh, come on. Can't be that bad. What did she do? Make another threat? Tell you how dumb and stupid we all are around here? No. She begged. For what? A bath? Sav, she wanted me to let her kill herself. I said no. She begged me to tell her to keep her head under the water till it was all over. She, um, had a little snap, I think we can call it. The young huntress clarified, not sounding too convinced in her own reasoning. It was certainly clear where her foul mood stemmed from now. Right, well, it's hardly surprising. This whole thing is supposed to be a worse punishment than death. Or at least a more useful one for us, Saf replied, not sure what else to say. A drill had been bound to service, and she had to serve or there would be hell to pay, most likely. Could we not aim for the latter of those two? I think being a slave till forever is bad enough, Fengi countered. Saf couldn't give much of a counter. In reality, she probably agreed with Fengi, but what more could they do? Fengi, Fen, we have treated her better than she has any right to. You have been better to her than pretty much anyone she could have hoped for. And she did ask for this, to put it fucking mildly. How is she now? Brooding, I guess. Had her lay down on the other side of the keep so Glira at least can't see her from her spot. Else she would probably be mocking her all night. Probably, yeah. Saf concur with a nod. Got any plans for what to do? She did seem a little more... Well, maybe less shitty is the word earlier today when we were camping. Maybe she's just having to deal with emotions for the first time in a while. That or she's trying to guilt trip you into doing what she wants. I don't know, Seth. I just don't know. I'll just keep trying. With a little luck, maybe she'll stop hating at least someone around here. That sure would help. Doesn't matter who, just someone who's on her side, I guess. The easiest way to make someone open up to a person they dislike is to convince them you both stand together against something worse. Maiko then added from next to Sapphire, both women giving a start. Saf flipped around in the bed to look at the royal guard, who was just staring up into the ceiling without a care in the world. Like grunts against the officers, or children and mums against stingy dads. You were here the whole time, Saf demanded in a forced hushness not wanting to wake anyone up in case they had gone to bed. I didn't feel like the floor, sorry, he replied with a dumb chuckle, turning to look Saf in the eyes. Have I ever told you how fierce you can look in the dim light? Enough to make my heart pound a little. Damn you and your magic, Saf grumbled, though she wasn't too mad. Not like he wasn't allowed in here after all, but he could have said something at least. She turned back around to look at Fengi, pushing up against him so she at least knew where he was. 
an arm reaching around her chest from behind, holding her gently. Sorry about that, Fengi. No, no, it's okay. I just forgot, that's all. The young copper dismissed, though clearly seeming a little uncertain about the situation. I wanted to just be quiet and let you talk, but I bet you five copper the easiest way to get her to trust someone is to give her an ally. Perhaps not you, though. Someone who can't actually do anything, but who agrees with her. Or at least pretends to. I guess so, yeah. Fengi responded, in a slow, pondering voice. Silence hanging in the air for a moment after. Then she looked down at Saf, lamplight glinting off her white snout. Eyes dim in the shadow, cast up against the ceiling. Ah, uh -uh. don't you look at me, I'm not doing it. Saf countered, wanting to kill that thought dead before it could take off. You sort of did with Tom back when he arrived, Fengi tried, clearly looking to try and haggle here. Okay, first of all, we do not talk about that. Second of all, he's not an insufferable arsehole and a literal cold-blooded murderer. No, he's quite warm from what I hear, actually, Micah added in from behind her, giving her a little squeeze. Very funny, I'm not doing it. Well, then who? Finky questioned. Sass spinning just her head around to try and look at Maiko, which only sort of worked. The corporal shuffled down a bit towards the foot of the bed, sneaking in under her head, and pretending to not be there. Aren't you the guy Victoria used to do literally this? Saf questioned rather pointedly. Maiko pushing in further. Maybe... The guard replied in a far too childlike tone for Saf's liking. This was not a laughing matter after all. Maiko, please, Fengi tried. Voice heartfelt and almost pleading. If half of what Saf said is true, then I'm sure you would do great. Hey, now, I'm not actually that great of a liar. I counter that one, Saf objected before he could carry on. Wow, what about Tom? He sounds like he's great at this stuff too. I mean, just look at Jarek's. I... We already have her working her butt off. That was about all Tom had to teach. Don't think that would do much with her. Please, Maiko. Oh boy. You know I have stuff to do, right? Like what? Spine on Pauline? Saf questioned with a huff. She knew full well that the Nook, or perhaps Rachuk, were making full use of their little spy. He was rarely seen actually working, after all. No, never. Who would ever be that reckless? Came the reply, followed by a big, over-exaggerated sigh. But fine. I'll try and befriend the murderous slave we have on hand. Just checking, she can't hurt me, right? I don't think so, no, Fengi offered. Saf could feel him swallow behind her. At least not directly. Perfect. I see no way this could possibly go wrong. Tom could feel as much as hear the wind howling over them. They were all trapped under what they called a dragon tent. Tom called it a tarp, and it was barely being held up by a few rickety poles. It didn't seal properly to the dragon's back either, but it broke the worst of the wind as they flew. Snow was getting in, and freezing cold air. The only heat they had came from some small metal and glass contraptions that looked a lot like a lantern, but were squatter. Thankfully they were able to burn more oil than a normal lantern, even if they did make some soot, but with how cold they all were, no one cared. Tom had tried to move his arms and legs into a slightly more comfortable position, while he waited for himself to freeze to death, but they barely budged. Everyone except the Inquisitor himself was tied down tight. You can't trust the grip of a nice shard, he had said, with an almost evil grin as they were secured for that day's flight. Tom was happy he had done it though, or perhaps it was Jelena who had been so relieved after a patch of turbulent air had cost her footing. Leaving her hanging from the ropes alone, not that they let her slide far, he had lost all sense of time. The flight was supposed to be but a six-hour hop, but that was before they encountered the storm. 
Neither Inquisitor Harvick nor Chaika seemed to care, simply letting the cadets know that it was going to get colder. And by the gods did his promise come true. Tom had ended up so cold, his, or more accurately, Jelena's memory had started to lapse. First in blinks, then a bit longer. Soon he woke with a start, only to find the light bleeding through the tarp had gone. His whole world was reduced to the glow of the oil burners, the constant howl of wind, and the incessant flapping of the tarps they were hiding under. He could not move, and he felt like he could barely breathe or look around. It was claustrophobic, and his mind was so slow he could not even panic. Everything was cold, numbness, and deafening howling wind. No one was talking. No one bothered. He doubted he could even scream over the noise. He didn't have the strength. This must be what Dakota felt like back at the lake. Only drowning too. When they set out, they had joked and jested about... How bad could it be? They had the finest travelling clothes, thick, luxurious coats, hoods, even pants and foot covers. He couldn't really call them boots, but they were warm. They were lined with sheep wool and made from sturdy, treated leather. He remembered a rainstorm they had faced shortly after departing the capital. It had barely phased them. And here they were. A collection of barely breathing popsicles heading towards their new home. The Fortress of Gaul Nurelion. Ah, there we are. I was worried we missed it for a moment there. Chika called out, seeming to take delight in the storm, banking into a downward spiral. Tom could not see anything, but maybe it would soon be over. Surely it would be warm inside. People lived here if only for three quarters of the year. A frozen bastion held by the Tika family, supposedly tough as an old pulling harness, but not crazy enough to stay through winter. They were apparently paid handsomely to guard the northern approaches, and provide a bastion where others may seek refuge, should it be needed. Tom had not even seen a painting of the God's Forsaken Place, but it had been described as a low, fat, round tower, with a few stocky buildings sticking up from its base. No more than eight stories tall, not much for a keep, but it had walls as thick as any fortress ever built to keep the cold out. Tom once again started to lose track of time. They stayed in the turn for what felt like an eternity, the constant turbulence throwing them around like a toy, an over 30 ton toy. And Chaika seemed to only grow more amused with herself as he came down for a landing. Suddenly they could see light, just a sliver, peeking out from under the tarp where it failed to seal. Then they came down, draconic feet setting down in the snow with claws hitting stone underneath. The wind kept howling despite them being on the ground, and slowly, the dragon trudged forward towards the light. Tom could feel his heart in the top of his throat. It was over. They were going to get into the heat soon. They were not going to freeze to death. He just felt so relieved. Soon they could make out the clacking of winches working away, as the light brightened enough that it almost started shining through the tarp. Willing his head to move, he looked around at the rest of the passengers. Glaz was lying next to him, with a dumb grin on her face. Best wake up in a hurry, cadet. You are on point, remember? He didn't even answer. He didn't even nod. He just stared at her and let out a tired grunt, hair still resting upon the padded back of Chaika. He had forgotten about that, and he could feel Jelena had too. Her heart started to pump faster, as the howling of the wind was replaced with a bustle of people outside, and the measured steps of the dragon. Light and heat rushed in faster and faster. His heart pounded, until it was all he could hear. Jelena had to confront the lord of this keep, and Harvick had wanted it done as soon as possible. She was not fit to try something like that now, 
She needed rest. But would the Inquisitor care? He had not seen the sort to wait for others to keep up thus far. Do or die trying, had been uttered more than once upon this trip already. Used to win there? Glass carried on. Tom hadn't even registered that she had been the one speaking. You're on, cadet. Get that shit off and run some laps of the hall to warm up. Harvick will not be left waiting. Understood. And that is all you will need, Dakota questioned, looking to foe, as she and Lynn Costa did the final rounds. They had apparently gotten confirmation that Archion had indeed arrived in the capital yesterday evening, after a rather lengthy detour around a storm had added another two days to the trip. But they had landed safe and sound. Once they had sold their cargo, they would be ready to start acquiring their orders. By the sounds of it, Galaxa might need to help out. Because there were a lot of wishes being made, and some of them were quite heavy. Others not so much. Like Foe's golden earrings. She wanted six of them. I guess her chances of ever making Gilded are much. As long as she doesn't try for a golden tiara, Tom chuckled to himself. No, I think that'll be most of it. I believe if you run out, they will leave out what's on the bottom of the list, or anything too hard to find. I get it, yeah. God, this is so much harder than just swinging by the market. Quite, Dakota acknowledged, more busy with her clipboard and Tom's calculator. Right, next, Fengi. Did you have anything more? Last chance. Some waterproof playing cards would be nice, and dice box. I think I'm going to be out in the rain a lot. Hmm. What about your travel coat? We made that one, right? Oh, Fengi, what about some more proper all-weather gear like the traders have? Bo added in, seeming quite enthused by the idea. Not a half bad idea, Dakota agreed, seeming to ponder for a moment. I suppose so, Fengi said cautiously. Saf knew well enough what stuff like that tended to cost. A lot of work went into equipment like that, and she also knew Fengi had plenty of things she wanted to spend money on. Not to mention keeping some help back. I will put it at the bottom, then, Dakota went with a nod, throwing a quick glance at Sapphire, winking. I already have your size, but we can always adjust it a little once it arrives. Saf pulled a gentle smile, looking to poor Fengi, who seemed resigned to the fact this was a good idea, despite the cost. What about you, Saf? Any last additions? No, just what's already on there. Have you got it all right there? Indeed. Would you like to check your shopping list? Yes, please, Saf replied, holding a hand out for the clipboard, which was probably handed to her. With a quick look over her list, all seemed to be in order. Some of that cider Ray had talked about, a flask or a bottle of whiskey that would be just hers, and a silver ring with a sapphire in it. She just had to get that, after all. There was a sapphire in her necklace, but it wasn't really centre stage. This time it would be. She had also taken a chance asking for a good book to read in winter, maybe something romantic. She knew this was Volson they were talking about here, so she wasn't expecting anything too extraordinary. Hopefully there will be a nice woman working in a bookstore or stand, where he goes looking to help him out. I think it's all there, she confirmed, handing it back to Dakota. Excellent. Anything else? Oh, oh, a bottle of cinnamon whiskey, Fo added excitedly, Dakota looking a little less bemused. I see. I will add it at the bottom. Perfect. With another glance around the table, to see if there were any more last-minute additions, she had retreated back to the family table, where Jordan just managed to get something at it as well before leaning back in his chair, looking quite comfortable sitting next to a puma. The nook was in her seat, like in the old days, surveying the hall before her. Everyone was done with the food, and some had even started clearing away plates and the like. 
As the clean-up progressed, the old lady stood up, clearly intent on addressing the room, and everyone started to quiet down at least a little. Very good. I believe that concludes the shopping lists. Now for today. We will be sending out our first hunting party for a little while. We will not be able to do much to the construction site. Jarex is going with you. Make good use of him. God knows how many runs we will get in before the cold sets in. Saf and Fengi are staying here to recover. Tomorrow, we will hold exercises with our allies here in the Royal Guard. Victoria too will be attending, though without Baron, sadly. So take a moment to freshen up your craft if you can find it. I would rather we not be humiliated tomorrow. The old lady carried on in good humour, looking towards Jordan, who seemed quite merry at the prospect as well. At the huntress table, they all started to dine each other a little, many looking to bow and foe. The two had barely received combat training, not that it was their fault, of course. Sass so supposed it was better late than never, but the tidiness would certainly show tomorrow, that much was assured. I have also heard a little bird sing that perhaps we shall soon have another vault open, likely the last before winter hits. We have little clue what lies inside, but I am sure it will be of quite some value to either us or the noble inquisition. This time, the old lady looked to Paulin, who nodded courteously. I hope you enjoyed the time off yesterday, even if it did not quite go as intended. There is much to do. Spring to it, but I am sure we shall have the time to take a slow enough winter, but hopefully not as boring as we are used to. Cheers to that! rang out from the guards' table, the rest soon enough joining in with a varying degree of enthusiasm. All in all, spirits were high though. Not hard to guess why, as everyone had just handed in the final few wishes for what they wanted, getting to actually spend some of all that money they earned. And, despite the trials of the last few days, everyone had made it back home in one piece. Only a drill would need true recovery time. She would get, however much turned out to be convenient, or just enough to see her airworthy, and that might even give Fengi a bit of time to work on her. Tom was sitting at the huntress table too today, beside Jackie right at the end. He only half-heartedly joined in the chair. He didn't seem happy or bubbly at all to Saf, nor did Jackie really. The two sat almost apart a little, and it was clear Jackie was holding him against her for pretty much the whole meal. Someone had a bad night again, I guess, Saf sighed to herself, her own enthusiasm dampened a touch. A quick glance towards Paulin revealed that she most definitely was paying attention to the duo, which certainly didn't help Sass' mood. Oh, you'd better not be to blame for this one too.